that I was asked with uh, uh, a colleague, Dr. Rockstrom uh, from Stockholm, to chair a commission uh, sponsored by The Lancet, a major medical journal in the UK, and funded by the Wellcome Trust, to uh, look at the possible pathway to feeding what will be about 9.8 billion people in 2050 a diet that is healthy and sustainable. Uh, the standard response is we need to increase a lot of grain production because we'll have more people and they want to eat more meat, so that we have to, the, the answer is to produce a lot more grains. That's uh, been the sort of agriculture industrial uh, response to that. But it doesn't look like that would be the healthiest response. Uh, so this is a huge challenge. We're way off track in terms of diet quality. Uh, we're way off track in terms of environmental trends. Uh, and we're adding 2.5 more billion people. And so how do we do this? Uh, it's enough to make you sort of run in the other direction, perhaps. But uh, we, we did uh, say we would take on this challenge. So we went through four steps here. First of all, defining a healthy diet based on best available evidence from controlled feeding studies, like I've described, long-term epidemiologic studies, and randomized trials where we have them. And then w there's another branch of science that's looked at planetary boundaries, really trying to define what is the limit of greenhouse gas that we can produce and be sustainable? What's the amount of water we can use and be sustainable? What's the amount of nitrogen fertilizer we can use and be sustainable? And so we defined those planetary boundaries with experts in that area. And then we looked at whether the healthy diet could fit in uh, and enable us to feed uh, 9.8 billion people uh, and remain within the healthy boundaries. And I'll show you we can barely squeak by if we do everything right. Uh, and then we looked at strategies to, to get there, which I won't have time to cover today. But uh, we, after reviewing a very extensive amount of literature, we set targets for different uh, components of the diet here, which is a table with a lot of numbers, and I won't uh, go into the details here, but we, uh, on the basis of just health, we were just looking at health outcomes, we did set ranges, and uh, for instance, for dairy, uh, we said zero to two servings a day, that you certainly don't have to have dairy, you can be healthy, and it looks like for up to two servings a day, you could be healthy, uh, and for red meat, it came down to the target was about uh, one serving per week, about a hamburger per week, or two as a target, and two as an upper limit, and, um, and, and so on. Or if you wanted to have big, juicy 12-ounce steaks, you could have that once a month if, you're, if you really want to have those. Uh, and we went through the list. I, again, I won't go into all of the details here. This is published in The Lancet, and it's available free online if you want to get a copy. It's about 60 pages of, uh, of a lot of detail. Uh, so this is what the plate would look like. In some ways, not too different than my plate from a distance, but quite different when you look at what it really means. And it's lots of, on the left side, by volume, roughly half uh, fruits and vegetables, and grains being whole grains. Uh, this this uh, particular version, and there's flexibility, is about 35% of calories from, uh, from fat. And uh, protein sources being primarily plant-based protein sources, and moderate amount of healthy fats in there with very little sugar. So uh, it, we um, went through lots of checks of uh, nutrient adequacy. Uh, it's very consistent with a traditional Mediterranean diet, interestingly enough, uh, that 35, we came, the targets are basically about 43 grams of red meat plus poultry per day. The traditional Mediterranean diet was about 35 uh, grams per day of red meat plus poultry. So it's very similar, but a lot of traditional diets in Africa, South America, Asia are, are quite compatible with these dietary targets. So this is looking at uh, just uh, focusing in on the implications for greenhouse gas emissions. And the food production boundary from the planetary boundaries of uh, people and the United Nations uh, Committee on Climate Change uh, basically allocates about five gigatons per year. Now that number is pretty hard to envision. It's so, so big uh, for global production of greenhouse gases. Uh, and in a 19, or 2010, our baseline data, uh, that's just about where we are. We had just, uh, the, the world was producing about 5.2, so just a little bit over the boundary 
But you add in 2.5 bi billion people who, and the projections are they're eating more red meat. Uh, China's actually caught up the United States now in red meat consumption, amazingly. Uh, and you go on the project out to 2050, which is our uh, sort of uh, goalpost that we were using. Uh, could have said another year, but that's what we were using. Uh, if we continue on the pleasant, uh, present trends, we would be at about 9.8 gigatons per year of greenhouse gas stuff from the, the food system. So about double the planetary boundary. So we're, our path is leading us way off track. But if we just adopted the targets that I described, that would get us back to 5.0. Five, five. Uh, 5.0, so we'd be right at the planetary boundaries by adopting these uh, dietary targets universally. And if we, uh, we could get some further reduction by reductions in waste and some improvements in agricultural practices, but the big reduction would become, is really coming from change in diet quality. Uh, then we did a series of analyses using three different models to estimate what percentage of deaths that could be prevented if everybody adopted those dietary targets. And there, all three uh, analyses came out to pretty similar numbers, but about 20 to 25% reduction in all causes of death around the world, uh, which is a big number, and for several reasons, that's almost certainly some underestimate uh, as well. This is adult deaths. Well, those are a lot of numbers, a lot of analyses. Uh, what does this look like down on the ground? Well, uh, this is actually our family farm. Uh, in Michigan, up in the thumb of Michigan, Bad Axe, little town there, uh, that uh, the farm was put up in the late 1800s. The barn was put up in the late 1800s, and uh, uh, this is our grandchild there. Uh, it's not, it's, he's a cute little guy, uh, actually getting a little, little bit bigger fast. Uh, and growing up, it was, um, it was probably a sustainable system that it had been like that for generations in the family. It was basically a small uh, dairy farm as one would find across the Midwest. But sadly, this is what it looks like now. Uh, and like the Midwest, the hedgerows have been disappeared. It's just vast monoculture of corn, sometimes alternating with soy. This is our farm, the next farm, and the next farm just all rolled up into one vast monoculture. And the sad thing is that this is not only destroying our environment, but of all the grain produced in the United States, only about 10% is actually eaten by humans. About 35% is for ethanol to fuel cars that are bigger than we need to be. About 45% is fed to animals. About 15% goes into high, uh, what they call manufacturing, like high fructose corn syrup. And only 10% is eaten by humans. So how could we have produced a system that is so bad for the environment, so bad for human health? Uh, now, this uh, is a little bit of a complicated figure, but I think uh, it, it's worth understanding uh, because this is from the uh, UN IPCC uh, uh, group that is defined a pathway to get to 2100 and not go over 2.5 degrees centigrade increase in temperature. Uh, and so I'll just take a couple minutes here and describe what's going on because it does uh, show how the food system and our diets fit into this, that uh, these the, uh, different bands are different sources of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, at the top is um, uh, from energy production, uh, pretty big, and then we have from um, manufacturing uh, and transportation, which are really big sector, huge big sectors, and that orange line sort of through the orange strip through the middle, that's from the food system. Uh, and that um, the, 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 the uh, goal is to get to zero net greenhouse gases, uh, in other words, production reaching um, uh, uh, sequestering by uh, uh, 2039. Uh, and the, uh, the goal point here is uh, this is running out to 2050. Uh, so you can see that uh, the, the orange line for food production, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that's five gigatons per year. Uh, that essentially, it's inevitable that we will produce some greenhouse gases from food production. And I projected out uh, that straight line across the top. That is where we go on the present path of uh, uh, that uh, the business as usual model, which ends up with about uh, almost 10 gigaton 
uh, year production compared to where we need to be. But by adopting the healthy dietary targets, we can get the food sector back to what it, will, what it should be according to the UN uh, pathway. Uh, so we can't get to the goal with, we overshoot the goal if we don't change our diets. But this also tells us we've got to, in fact, we, we're in the food area, we, we need to do our work, but these other sectors have to change in a very big way too. That projection of getting there is assuming that we're basically done with fossil fuels by 2050. We do have to leave that coal, that gas, and the petroleum in the ground, uh, or else we will not uh, come anywhere near uh, achieving the goal. Uh, so uh, I, I think that's an important point to keep in our minds. We need to do everything possible. The, the getting there, even with the healthy dietary targets, will not be possible unless we get fossil fuels out of our world economy, world uh, all our systems uh, by 2050. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, this is a huge, huge issue. At the way we move about, how we uh, uh, heat our buildings, uh, everything we do does need to be done with green energy or we will not come close to meeting the goals. That green section at the bottom is also noteworthy because that's a big assumption. That's carbon sequestration. And actually, we don't really know how to do that quantitatively yet. And it's, we're counting on a huge amount of that by 2050 of sequestering carbon. Uh, the, the best way to do it from what we know now is, is planting trees. And some agricultural systems can sequester some carbon, but there, we need a whole lot of research investment in that area because there seems to be a lot of variability. And it, 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 uh, many agricultural systems do not sequester carbon, even, even when they're producing uh, healthy food in a way that is relatively uh, sustainable. So that's the, the uh, big map uh, picture, I think, and it's uh, worth trying to understand. Just to conclude, we are at a fork in the road. Our current path uh, is fueling climate change uh, and other environmental damage, uh, and also the non-communicable disease epidemic. Uh, these environmental changes are damaging our resources for food production, so we're in sort of this uh, vicious circle again the climate change is also uh, making it difficult to produce the food that, that 9.8 billion people will need. But the good news is that there is a double win path that can improve health and well-being for everyone. Uh, and this will require unprecedented changes in the foods that we eat and how we produce them. And achieving this will require the active engagement of every sector of our country, certainly everybody here. And just to end on the positive note, we do have a good weapon, if you might call it, on our side, and that is good, healthy food, which can be a double win in helping us uh, achieve a sustainable environment, making everybody much healthier, and it can be really enjoyable at the same time if it's produced in a good way. So thank you.